So, so f is a differentiable function on open interval a b, and if f assumes maximum or minimum at c in a b, then f prime c must be zero. All right. So this was uh, some variation of this was also called Fermat's theorem. Uh, many of the Fermat's theorem. So let's uh, look at this. So, so let's try to prove this. Um, so uh, without loss of generality. Let uh, f of c be maximum of f on a b. Yeah, or you can prove the the minimum in the same manner. So what does it mean? This means what? This means that f of x. Is less than or equal to f of c for all x belonging to. So this is what it means by f having a maximum at c. By a maximum here we mean absolute maximum. Okay. So now, um, so we'll try to prove this. So we want to prove that f prime c is equal to zero, and we'll prove we'll prove this. We'll prove this by f prime c is greater than or equal to zero and f prime c is less than or equal to zero, which will basically, you know, if you have, um, if you have both of these conditions together, then it must be zero. So let's start with a uh, sequence. So we have c is inside, we have a, b. So consider sequence converging to c. So let xn be a sequence. Xn be a sequence in a b converging to so you can always basically take a sequence like that right i mean like take for example xn can be c minus 1 over n for sufficiently large n Why are we uh, including the case of for sufficiently large n? Because we want it to be inside AB, all right? So now, so this be a sequence converging to C, but F is, differenti uh, F is differentiable, F is differentiable. So for differentiable function, we have the following. This means that the sequence F of Xn minus F of C over Xn minus C converges as well and this converges to f prime c right so here i should have mentioned that xn be sequence with xn less than c and of course it's greater than an so it's here so now let's look at this sequence so your f of xn is less than or equal to f of c and xn minus c is greater than zero. So therefore this is a sequence of, this sequence has terms which are greater than or equal to zero. So this implies f prime c is greater than or equal to, right? Because since f of xn minus f of c or xn minus c is greater than or equal to zero. So we have shown that f prime c is greater than or equal to zero. Now let's move, do the other way around. So let's take, so this was your xn, and let, now let's do the same thing with yns. So let yn be a sequence in a, b, such that yn converges to c and yn is what is, so we are on this side, so yn is greater than or equal to c or strictly greater than c and of course less than b. Okay, so such yns can always be constructed. 
right? For example, take c plus one by n for sufficiently large n. For large n. Okay. So now we have this sequence. Uh, now let's investigate f of y n minus f of c over y n minus c. Now this sequence. So the top is always less. Uh, so y n minus c. So we have. Oh, I see. So we have y n minus c. This is going to be a negative. Oh, okay. I see. See. Let me just. Um, So in this case, similar, the top is negative, the bottom is positive. So the whole thing is going to be less than or equal to zero. But uh, F is, so differentiable. This implies what F of Y n minus F of C, Y n minus C converges to F prime C, which is going to be less than or equal to zero. Therefore, we get from one and two. So from one and two, from one and two, f prime c is equal to zero. Okay, so this is how you go about it. All right. So um, okay. So similarly, you can prove when f of c is minimum. All right. So that will work out the similar way. Now let's look at the uh, the Rolle's mean value theorem. So Rolle's mean value theorem tells you the following. So let f be a continuous function on a closed interval a b, so you, and uh, it's differentiable on open interval a b with f of a equals to f of b. So let's draw this scenario. So we have So what do we have? We have continuous function on a closed interval a, b. So this is a, this is b. And we need f of a equals to f of b. Then this tells us that there is at least one point c in a, b such that f prime c is zero. That means the derivative at that point is is zero. That means the slope of the tangent line is horizontal. And so, it's zero. so this is what Rolle's mean value theorem is about. Okay. So let's see how to prove this. So um, so note that A B is compact. So AB is compact, this implies F of AB is compact. Now compact sets have, so compact means it's closed and bounded. So every closed and bounded, this implies what? F has maximum and minimum values on a b okay. so you can use whatever result you want i mean you can say a b is compact therefore f of a b is compact therefore this set has a maximum and minimum right or you can use the earlier result we also proved that uh, in when we are discussing continuous function that if you take a function on a on a on a, on a compact set a continuous function then uh, uh, you will get maximum and minimum. So either way. Okay, so F has maximum and minimum values. So this means what? There exist X1 and X2 belonging to AB such that what happens? Such that F of X1 is less than or equal to F of X. Uh, X2. You get maximum as X2. F of X2 is maximum. F of X1 is minimum. So, and this is true for all x belonging to. This is what it means by having maximum and minimum. 
Now there are two cases. Uh, one is a degenerate case, the case when x1 equals to a, x2 equals to b. In that case, in that case, we'll get what? f of a equals to f of b equals to f of x. So therefore, what all the points satisfy. So this means what f of x is a constant function. Therefore, f prime c equals to zero, right? Where c belonging to a, b is any point. Any point whatsoever inside. Yep. So it is, it is vacuously true there. Now consider the case that these are not the endpoints. So, so let's assume that F has what F has maximum or minimum at a point C inside AB. All right. If you're able to do this, if you're able to prove this, then we are going to invoke the earlier theorem, right? If we have a function which is differentiable on open interval AB, F assumes basically maximum or minimum value there. Okay. So let's go back to Rolle's theorem here. Again, F is continuous on this, differentiable on this, and F of A equals to F of B. Then there exists one point C such that F prime C is zero. All right. So where am I using all these properties though? I'm using these properties, say for example, I'm having here, right? So I use the first part, continuity part here, to show that the image is compact, right? Now let's use the differentiability part. To use the differentiability part, I will, where will the differentiability be used? I want to use 2.1 theorem inside, so I have to use the differentiability, right? So, so if F has maximum or minimum at C, then from earlier theorem, then from theorem, whatever, call it 2.1, theorem 2.1, we get what? F prime C equals to zero. So you have proved the Rolle's theorem, all right? Uh, so this is the Rolle's theorem. So the idea is the following. So let f be a continuous function on a closed interval AB and differentiable on open interval AB. Then there exists one point C in AB such that f prime C is f of B minus f of A over B minus A. So let's first draw the diagram for this. So here, the only difference is you're not said you're not said f of a equals to f of b. Otherwise you have the same condition, right? f is continuous on a, b and f is differentiable on a, b. So again, we have two points here. Let's, so let this be the interval a, b and we'll impose that f of a is not equal to f of b. And let's draw this guy. Okay. So now, what is f of b minus f of a or b minus a represents? So basically, if you look at a comma f of a and b comma f of b, then, if, then the slope of this line is f of b minus f of a over b minus a, right? So, so the slope of this line is f of b minus. Now, what mean value theorem is saying that at some point f prime c inside, I will have that this tangent line. So this tangent line, uh, there will be the tangent line will be, will have the same slope as this secant line, right? So, yeah, so. Yeah, that at this point, you see these two lines are parallel. That means that at C, you will get F prime C equals to the slope of this line, which is again, F of B minus F of A over B minus A. Okay, so this is what the, the result is telling us. Very intuitive, but let's try to prove it. So to prove it, we'll um, take a new function 
g of x so that we can apply rule theorem on that so we want g of x as a function where what what do we want to encode we want to encode that uh, when you take g prime you want basically to be f prime c minus f of b minus f of a right so what do i want really i want when i take the derivative when i take the derivative it turns out that that i need basically to encode this guy as a zero of my my function so let's take g of x to be f of b minus f of a over x minus a plus f of a consider the following function yeah now what is um let's consider another h of x to be f of x minus g of x which where f is your original function all right so now what is h of a h of a so let's just write this down f of a f of x minus f of b minus f of a this should be basically b minus a times x minus a minus f of a you say why such a choice of function i mean it's carefully constructed out of it i mean we can discuss the construction in a minute but let's look at this function so this function is basically difference of two continuous functions so this is continuous on ab and it's also difference of two differentiable function on ab the open interval ab therefore uh, h is differentiable on a b now let's look at h of a what is h of a going to be h of a is going to be f of a minus g of a f of a minus g of a so this will become a minus a which is zero what will survive is f of a minus f of a uh, which will be basically zero and what is h of b h of b is going to be f of b uh minus what we'll get here is f of b minus f of a over b minus a times b minus a minus f of a these will cancel out and you'll see that f of b goes away with this guy and this take care of this guy all right so nobody correct mm, this is correct because we have f of b minus f of b so minus of minus will make it plus okay so it works out so this is also zero so by rolls theorem on for rolls theorem for for what for h of x we can find c belonging to a b such that h prime c equals to 0 however when you take the derivative of this so what is h prime c so h prime c is f prime c minus g prime c uh, and uh, uh, this is going to be f prime c minus let's look at the derivative of this with respect to uh, to x this is simply f of b minus f of a or b minus a right so f of b minus f of a or b minus a equals to so we get what therefore h prime c equals so we get what this implies that implies f prime c equals to f of b minus f of a over b minus a right so uh, um, okay. Okay, so uh, let's try to uh, look at the following theorem, which says that um, uh, if you take a differentiable function on an open interval i, uh, sorry, on an interval i, not open interval necessarily, and if f prime, uh, f, f prime x is greater than zero, 
then you get uh, that the function is strictly increasing on i and so on and so forth. So let's try to look at this. So um, again, we'll use mean value theorem for this. So let f prime x be greater than zero on i. All right, so what do you want to show? We want to show that it's increasing, right? So it's strictly increasing. So consider x1 and x2 belonging to i with x1 less than x2. Yeah, we need to show, need to show that for what, does it, what is the definition of increasing function? If x1 less than x2, we want to show f of x1 is less than f of x2, right? Now by mean value theorem, what do we get? We get there exists C belonging to X1, X2, such that what? Such that we have X1 minus X2 upon F of X1 minus F of X2 equals to F prime C. Yeah, this is the mean value theorem. All right, again, what do you have to basically argue, right? I mean, like this is not a complete argument, right? We should say, well, f is f prime is greater than zero on this. F is f is con, f is differentiable on i. Implies f is continuous on i. And both of these together imply that f is continuous on closed interval x1, x2 and differentiable on x1 comma x2, right? I mean, like you can't use a theorem without basically saying that the requirements are met, right? So this would mean, this implies f of x1 minus f of x2 equals to f prime c times x1 minus x2. Now note that, um, so we have x1 is less than x2, so this implies x1 minus x2 is less than, this is basically less than zero. This is greater than zero. So this whole thing will be less than zero. Now that would mean that f of x1 is less than f of x2. Therefore f is increasing. Right? So increasing on i. Y on I since X1 and X2 belonging to I were arbitrary, right? I mean, like we didn't take anything special about them. Okay, so uh, this is how we'll prove that uh, if F prime X is greater than zero, then it's strictly increasing on I, right? Converse is also true, but the, for that, the function has to be differentiable, right? I mean, like you can't just say converse is true right away because the derivative should exist for this thing to happen, right? Okay. Now let's look at the next theorem, which is the intermediate value theorem for the derivative. So let's see what does this theorem tells. The theorem tells us the following. Suppose f is differentiable on closed interval a, b. Now you see we are discussing the differentiability on a closed interval. And uh, let k be any point between f prime a and f prime b. In that case, um, in that case, any point between, well, I mean, I'm assuming that without loss of generality, assume that f prime a is less than f prime b. You can prove the other way similarly. Then what we are saying is that there exists, there exists a c in a b such that f prime c equals to k. Okay, so this is an intermediate value theorem for the for the for the uh, derivatives. All right. Now note that if in some sense this is true if you think about your f prime as a continuous function, right? If f prime was also a continuous function, you can call it g and apply the mean value theorem there, right? Of course, it has to satisfy all the things you need. So uh, so let's try to prove this. So without loss of generality. 
again, let's have k f prime a less than k less than f prime b. Now, let's define a new function g of x, which will encode, again, what we want is that it should encode f prime c equals to k in it. So we want basically something whose derivative when we take and find when it's zero becomes what? This thing here. Okay. So let's take g of x to be f of x minus kx. And again, this guy is basically what? This guy is defined on a, b is what is, uh, so g is also continuous, right? Why? Because f is continuous, k is continuous, since f and k are continuous. Again, why is f continuous? Because f is differentiable on ab, closed interval ab, therefore it's continuous there. Um, and what do we have? We have, uh, we have g prime a is less than zero, less than g prime b, right? Why is that? Because g prime a is going to be f of a, so if you look at this guy, construct g prime a, g prime a is going to be derivative of this, so f prime a minus k. And if you look from here, you will have that f prime a minus k. So this is going to be less than zero. And then we have g prime b is going to be f prime b minus k, which is greater than zero, right? Now, so therefore, what happens if you take a function like this? So g, g prime a uh, is f prime a minus k and g prime b is f prime b minus k. Now g is continuous, right? So g is continuous on a, b. Right, so therefore what G will assume, this implies G assumes maximum and minimum, both assumes maximum and minimum on AB. Yeah, so at some point say, say at C, it assumes minimum. Now this would imply what? G prime C equals to zero. And that would mean that is what? That means G of C equals to, uh, G prime C equals to zero. That would mean that F prime, what is G prime here? g prime x is f prime x minus k. That would mean that is f prime c equals to k. Okay. So, so if it assumes minimum, then we have f prime c equals to k. All right. So the problem is not that. The problem is what if c, so we want to basically argue that c is inside a b. Right? We don't want to say that it happens at the end point. So claim that C, so we have already found out such a G, sorry, such a C such that G prime C is zero. That means F prime C is Z, K. That is not the problem. The problem is basically, the interesting part is to show that C to show that C belongs to AB. Right. Now for that, assume the, note the following, what is G prime B? G prime B is basically limit as X goes to B, g of x minus g of b over x minus b. Yeah, so what I'm trying to say is that I'm trying to say that it is not my endpoint b. And then I'll argue similar way that it's not the endpoint a. So let's see that g prime c. So my goal is to show that this is greater than zero. And then it can't be, that means that c cannot be b. So notice that this is going to be So if you look at this guy, this guy is always greater than zero. And what is the reason for that? The reason is 
that g of x minus g of b upon x minus b, if you look at this ratio, this is greater than zero for all x in what? In a, b. Right? So for all x in a, b, now note that the, the definition of limit tells you that uh, you are in some deleted neighborhood of B, but this is good enough. So therefore, what do we get for X less than B, we'll get G of X is less than G of B. Therefore, what does it mean? Therefore, G of B is not minimum, all right? So therefore, C is not B. Because after all, what is what is my C? C is the minimum of, of my G function. So by arguing that G prime B has to be greater than zero, I'm saying that C can't be B, okay? So this takes care of, of this theorem, which is the, so similar argument, similar argument holds for similar, argument for c not equal to x okay all right so um that is that um let's so here comes now the inverse function theorem so let's look at this theorem so it says suppose that f is differentiable on interval i and f prime x is not zero Then it says that F is going to be injective and F prime inverse is differentiable on I. Sorry, not F prime, F inverse is differentiable on F of I and the derivative formula is given by F inverse of I Y is one upon F prime of X where Y equals to F of X. So I can use a, um, so let's, so the, the important part is to prove the, the, the differentiability argument but you can basically see that f of f inverse of f of x equals to x, right? Let's use some algorithmic. I mean, like this is not comp this is not the proof though. So if you take derivative on both sides, if you use the chain rule, let's call f of x as y. Let f of x be y. Then you get what f inverse of y equals to x. Take derivative on both sides, so we get what? So you get this implies f prime y times y prime equals to one. So therefore we get f prime of y, sorry, derivative of this, right? Where's my chain rule? This is the chain rule, right? So let me write it properly. Otherwise, so we have, if we take that, so we take derivative on this side, we get what? f inverse of y prime times y prime equals to one. So we get f inverse of what? f inverse prime equals to one by y prime, which is one by f prime of so this is how the, the derivative looks, right? Yeah, recall the chain rule was what? Uh, you had f of g of x, then the chain rule told you that this was f prime evaluated at g of x multiplied by g prime of x. So similarly here you have derivative of this whole thing. So it is f inverse prime evaluated at y, the inside function multiplied by y prime, which is one. Okay, so this is the mechanics of it, but this is not the proof, right? So we are trying to, this is just a formula we have, right? So let's try to prove this properly. So take f prime x and f prime x is not zero for all x and i. Now, so this is a differentiable. So now this would mean that either f prime x is greater than zero on i or f prime x is less than zero on i. 
Yeah, there will be exactly one behavior. You will say why? If not, for some x, if f prime x is greater than zero and f prime x2 is less than zero for some x2 belonging to x1, x2 belonging to i, then the intermediate value theorem for the derivative will kick in, right? You will have f prime x1. So if this happens, then by then by intermediate value theorem for derivatives, there exists c belonging to x1, x2, such that f prime c equals to zero, which is contradiction, right? Which is not true, not possible. So therefore, there's only one thing which is possible, which namely that either is greater than zero or it is less than zero, all right? So without loss of generality, let's take one of them. Let's take f prime x to be greater than zero, right? The other case will be exactly the same, right? So this means what f prime, this means f is strictly increasing This means what? This means f is injected. Again, you don't need to know, write down this proof, but let me just basically mention you why is that. If f is strictly increasing, so if x1 is not equal to x2, this implies x1 is either less than x2 or x1 is greater than x2. This implies, this would imply because it's increasing, we'll have f of x1 is less than f of x2, or in the other case, we'll get or f of x1 is greater than f of x2. In both the cases, this will imply that f of x1 is not equal to f of x2, right? I mean, trivial thing, but I thought I should just mention. So if your function is strictly increasing, then it is, it is injective. And similarly, if the function is strictly decreasing, that means if derivative is less than zero, then it's also what? Uh, injective, right? So the injectivity part is taken care of. So the first part is taken care of. Now, we want to discuss about the differentiability now, all right? The second part is about differentiability on f of i. So, so we want to show that it's differentiable on f of i. So let, oops. So let's take, all right, so let y and be any sequence. So we want to show, so y and b, so we want to show that y, it is, F is differentiable. We want to talk about F inverse, right? So F inverse is differentiable on Y belonging to F of I. I'll write in bracket N, okay. So now let Y and B a sequence, Y and B a sequence in f of i such that f of y sorry in f of y such that y n converges to y okay so you can construct such a sequence uh, for many reasons first of all uh, there are many reasons one reason is that uh, if i is an interval if you have a continuous function f of i is also an interval all right so you uh, that was uh, discussed uh, earlier uh, no we had about uniform continuity, right? That that result was true about uniform continuity. Um, but you can still argue here that if y is a if y n is a sequence in f of y, then y n, uh, then f of i will also be a kind of interval. So now y n let y n converge to y. So let's uh, let's try to show. Let's try to find out. So let y n converge to y. Then consider f inverse of y n minus y upon y n minus y. Yeah, so consider this sequence. Um, so this sequence is going to be, so we took y n to be in, uh, so this sequence, we want to show that this sequence to show 
to show that this sequence converges, right? So since F is injective, what do we get? Since F is injective, uh, F inverse of Y equals to X is a unique quantity or unique number, right? So I can write this as what F inverse of Yn minus F of F inverse of y n minus f of uh, f of x upon y n huh. y n minus y. Okay, so I'm here now. Let me think for a second. So I have a y n sequence converging in f of i to y. I want to show that this sequence converges. All right, so now um, how do I go about it? I can take my uh, F inverse of Yn also as a sequence, uh, but I will have to show, yeah, okay, just a second. So we have F inverse of Yn is a sequence in I and F inverse of Ybx. Now we took this to be F inverse of Yn we chose to call it as xn and since it's a we have here that yn is converging to y with yn not equal to y then we'll have xn is f inverse of it this converges to x but since it's an injective function xn is not equal to x So now uh, what will we get? So now we want to investigate limit as n goes to infinity of f inverse of y n minus f inverse of y upon y n minus y. Now this can be rewritten as f inverse of y n is x n minus x upon f of what? f of y n is f of x n because we have f inverse of, so this would mean f of x n equals to y n right minus f of x limit as n goes to infinity now this is going to be limit as n goes to infinity of one upon f of x n minus f of x over what over uh over x n minus x, x. and now this does not exist right you have to argue that this limit is not zero and that is given to us already right that this limit is not zero so this is equal to by f prime x note that f prime x is not zero therefore this makes sense so what have we shown that this limit so this sequence this sequence converges to one by f prime x. This means what? This means that derivative of this guy is equal to one by f prime x. So we have shown two things here. One, by showing the convergence of sequence, we have said that this is differentiable and derivative is Right. So this takes care of your inverse function theorem. Right. So it can be used to find out the derivatives of function. All right. So um, now from here, where do we go next? So where to go next? Um, in next class, this is what we're going to discuss. We'll discuss the concept of Riemann integral.
So what does it mean by function being Riemann integral? I will pause the, uh, I'll pause